Good afternoon. My name is Marianne de Visser. You might have seen and heard me at the panel meeting uh, this morning. I'm from Amsterdam, uh, the Netherlands. I'm a neurologist by training. And as I said this morning, uh, the journey started in the US, the journey for uh, patient care, my interest in patient care and research in myositis. I worked uh, at the lab of Dr. Engel, and he's an expert on uh, myositis uh, in, uh, uh, at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, uh, Minnesota, decades ago. And, uh, and, and since then, uh, I have been deeply involved in both the patient care, as I said, I'm a neurologist and research on myositis. And today uh, I was asked to share uh, the experiences, my experience, but also the experiences from studies, from literature on IVM uh, with you. And yesterday I noticed that I can, can learn a lot from uh, your experiences that you are willing to share with me. Um, inclusion body myositis was uh, an unrecognized until the 80s, the 90s of the previous century. And, and then we thought that it was a very, very rare disease. Now we know better. We know that it's the most frequent muscle disease in people over than 50 years of age. And we also know that, uh, and we don't know why, that uh, men are more frequently um, affected than females. And as regards the prevalence, the frequency uh, you see that there are uh, very, that there is a variety of figures, 1.1 per million in Turkey and 50.5 per million in South Australia, and uh, also a very low frequency in the Netherlands. But we think that these low figures uh, have to be ascribed to the fact that um, inclusion body myositis at that time. Uh, the, the figures, the data were collected in the Netherlands about 10 years ago, that at that time IBM was under-recognized, as I said before. Uh, and, and, and this is uh, from a quite recent, also in Norway, quite recently uh, performed study. So what does Norway and South Australia have in common? Have in common? Well, they have in common that the, the studies looking for the patients have been recently uh, investigated. A and they have in common that IBM is uh, also uh, occurring there. So uh, it's, it's a disease which occurs uh, worldwide. Nothing else. This has nothing to do with... With its with location on the planet? It has nothing to do with... No, Minnesota. not that we know of, no. Norway being here, South Australia, you know, being on the southern hemisphere. But I, I, I'll, I'd like to show this to you um, because it, it nicely shows that IBM is um, much more easily recognized nowadays as compared to 10, 15 years ago. We are, as physicians, are much more aware of, uh, of IBM. That's a lot of people for Western Australia. Yeah. Australia. Yeah, but as I said, I mean, it's the frequent, most frequent muscle disease in, in, in people uh, older than 50, and there are hundreds of muscle diseases. Yeah. Yeah. The disparity between the different countries, might that be due to the reporting procedures? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and whether uh, these patients are recognized or not. Yeah. Um, how do patients with IBM present themselves? I will show you later a couple of slides uh, uh, with data derived from surveys amongst clinicians and, and uh, much more importantly, data derived from surveys uh, amongst patients. But what we do know is um, that uh, quite a number of people present uh, to their first their GP and then they are referred to a neurologist or a rheumatologist because of falling. Uh, and that has to be ascribed to the weakness of the thigh muscles. So falls and difficulty 
uh, getting up from a chair or getting up the, the stairs. Uh, another possibility uh, is that because of the, uh, the hand muscle weakness, they complain about decreased dexterity. And the third possibility is that because of the weakness of the swallowing muscles, patients complain about swallowing difficulty. And there are also patients uh, who complain about uh, all the, who have uh, difficulty both with falling, with decreased dexterity, and swallowing difficulty. What we know about IBM, in contrast to the other myositis subtypes, is that it's very slowly progressive. Uh, especially in the beginning and, 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 and that implies that often uh, the patients do not go uh, to the GP or the GP does not recognize that there is muscle weakness. Uh, and uh, over the years if the uh, weakness is progress uh, progressing uh, it, uh, it, it might well be that patients are just able to stand and, and, and the next year uh, end up in a, in a wheelchair, although it does not mean that the, the, the pace of uh, deterioration is much faster, but there is uh, uh, not much reserve. So it's a very slowly progressive muscle weakness, uh, as I said, in contrast to dermatomyositis, to polymyositis, and also in contrast to these diseases, there is asymmetry one can have uh, weakness of the right hand and the left hand can be perfectly normal or there is difference uh, in the size of the thighs whereas in dermatomyositis and polymyositis uh, the weakness is strictly symmetrical. Uh, and, uh, and another difference is that in polymyositis and dermatomyositis the weakness is always close to the body here in the shoulder girdle and the upper arms pelvic girdle and, and the thighs, whereas indeed in inclusion body myositis also the thighs are affected, but the hands, as I said, or the forearms and even uh, the, the muscles that, that lift the feet farther away from uh, the trunk. So that uh, uh, is the characteristic uh, distribution of weakness, thigh muscles, finger flexors, uh, the, the, the swallowing muscles, and I put between brackets facial weakness. We know that the facial muscles can be a little bit weak, uh, but patients usually do not complain about that. And usually, usually, uh, there is no muscle pain. But I must also uh, uh, hasten to say that we have not specifically asked patients whether they have muscle pain or, or not. It, it's not something they uh, complain about when they show up for the first time um, in the clinic. These are some uh, pictures of the muscle weakness. You see on, on the left the, the thin thigh, and you see on the uh, right upper picture that someone is trying to uh, make a fist, and that is uh, possible on the right, but not possible uh, on the left because of the weakness of the flexor of the fingers. And these pictures show the swallowing uh, difficulty. Uh, here is a piece of uh, food, but it's quite difficult uh, to, uh, to pass on to the stomach because there is some sort of stricture here. I'll come back to that later. If there are any questions uh, or you disagree with me, please shout and we're going to, to uh, try to respond to your question. And you need to speak into the microphone so okay. they can get it on the video. Um, Do you talk a little bit more about the swallowing muscle? I'm going to talk about it, yeah. Okay, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Um, what I'm going to show you here is a, a patient of mine um, when I saw her for the first time, and we hadn't diagnosed uh, her at that time, but she uh, tries to get up from a chair, and uh, she does that in a, a peculiar way, and at that, that time we noted that she had weakness uh, of her uh, thigh muscles. I get out of the way. Well, you see, it, it's rather cumbersome for her to get up in that 
stand to a standing position. You have had questions. You, you say slowly progressing. Can you give me a, a time reference on that? You know, can, it, I know it's hard. No, but I'm going to discuss that later. Okay. It's, it's slow between inverted commas. Because we know from the data we have collected that uh, uh, from the time of diagnosis, which is not necessarily the time of onset of the disease, from the time of diagnosis uh, to uh, wheelchair dependency is about 15 years. So that's not that slow. That is slow as compared to dermatomyositis and polymyositis, where people uh, have acute onset or subacute onset of muscle weakness and can be wheelchair dependent uh, in, within a time frame of about a few months. Yeah? Uh, no, this is, uh, yeah, um, this, these pictures um, show what we mean with finger flexor weakness. Uh, it, it's quite difficult, I try to explain it to you. We have two sorts of finger flexors. We have what we call the superficial finger flexors and that bends our fingers like this. And then we have what we call the deep flexors, and that bends the, the what we know, call the, I, I don't know how you would call it, distal part of the finger, only this. So these are two different muscles, and they have two different functions. You see it here, this is the uh, superficial flexor, and this is the deep flexor. And in IBM, first deep flexors and then the superficial flexors are affected. This is uh, one patient of mine, and you can see that here on the right, uh, the uh, superficial flexor is intact, is able to do this. And on the left, both the deep and the superficial flexors are affected because he's not able uh, to bend his fingers uh, at all. And uh, here uh, you see that the deep flexor is uh, affected and, uh, and the superficial flexor is not completely okay, but uh, he's able to, to make some sort of fist. But he's not able to cover uh, his nails. I hope this is clear. What, what does it mean if it's not asymmetric, but it's, it's symmetric? I don't know. We don't know why it's asymmetric because it's very unusual for every muscle disease to be asymmetric. We don't know. If it's symmetric, though, if you, if you said it's IBM, it's asymmetric. You, you, I, I wouldn't say that if someone has symmetric muscle weakness that he does not have IBM, but it's it's more common to see a, a symmetry. Okay. But in well advanced cases. Um, uh, there is usually uh, involvement on both sides. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to show you now a video of a male patient and uh, it has taken me quite a while to diagnose him as inclusion myositis because he was referred to me by the ENT arts, uh, uh, the ENT specialist and the gastroenterologist um, uh, uh, because they could not find a cause for his swallow swallowing difficulty. Uh, and uh, as I said, it took me a long time to diagnose him as IBM. And here is a video taken after I diagnosed him and he tells me uh, about uh, his swallowing difficulty. It's subtitled. Is it, can you read it in the back? He says if he is nervous, the swallowing difficulty worsens. 
and sometimes the the food gets stuck. And it started with the solid food and later on also with liquids. He's a bit embarrassed when I ask him why he waited for a year to go to the doctor. And here I ask him whether there are other difficulty with speaking, with breathing, with the strength in his leg and arm muscles. So I summarized this on the next slide that he has progressive swallowing difficulty since about a year. As I said, in particular uh, solid food, he needs to uh, have frequent meals and uh, only take small bites. Uh, what was frightening is that he uh, sometimes had to cough when he was eating and he had the feeling that he choked. Uh, and sometimes the food came through the nose. And when he noticed that, he went to the GP because he thought that is not normal. Uh, he was uh, not an obese man, so losing seven uh, kilograms is, is, is quite a, uh, uh, a loss of weight. And in the beginning, there were no problems with drinking. As I said, he was first referred to his uh, primary care physician, to the ENT specialist, and to the gastroenterologist. And they did a video fluoroscopy. And I show you uh, a, a video of the video fluoroscopy, first normal, and then from a patient with IBM, but not my patient. So here you see that the contrast goes through the uh, esophagus. And here is a patient with IBM. And then you see that some of the uh, contrast goes through the windpipe. And that makes people cough. Well, our patient also had difficulty uh, with swallowing, as I said. And the video fluoroscopy showed uh, abnormalities. Um, one of the muscles was uh, uh, swollen and the contrast, uh, there was some stasis of the contrast, the contrast didn't go to the stomach and, and there was also a problem, problem that if uh, the food uh, went to the stomach it came up again uh, to the esophagus. So the gastroenterologist said, well there are clearly abnormalities, uh, I do not know of any disease which can cause this, why uh, don't we ask the neurologist to have a look? So he came uh, to my clinic. I have to, to mention that the ENT specialist treated him with Botox, and that was quite effective for about uh, a year. Uh, and when I saw him, I did all sorts of tests because there are quite a number of neurological uh, disorders which can present with uh, dysphagia, uh, swallowing difficulty. For instance, ALS, and you must have heard about uh, ALS, that's also sometimes very difficult to diagnose, and we do uh, EMG, uh, etc. sometimes a muscle biopsy, uh, but uh, he didn't look like someone with uh, ALS because he had the swallowing difficulty for about a year, and if he had had ALS, there would have been other symptoms as well. So what do you do as a doctor if you have run quite some tests and you still don't know uh, the diagnosis? Well then you say to each other, I'm sorry, I don't know what's wrong. I, well, I know that you have swallowing difficulty and there must be an underlying uh, disease, an underlying diagnosis. Uh, but why don't I see you, let's say, every three months? That's what I did. And after about a year, he complained about fatigue in the legs and he said it feels like I have walked the marathon. So what I then did was uh, do an MRI and his MRI was normal. But usually in IBM 
you can see uh, severe abnormalities. And here you see an, an MRI uh, which has been taken from a, a thigh. And you see here the hamstrings and the upper part uh, is black. And that means that those are the thigh muscles here. And that means that the muscle tissue has been replaced by fat. Yes? So it says select the most suitable site for muscle biopsy. So if someone presents with if someone presents with asymmetric weakness, which leg would you suggest getting the biopsy done on? What I want is an affected muscle, but not a muscle that is completely replaced by fat. So I would not take a muscle uh, a muscle biopsy from these two muscles. I would then go to another affected muscle. Because if I would have taken a biopsy from here, I would have looked through the microscope and I would only have seen fat. So when they did my muscle biopsy and I told them, I said, well, my right leg is so much weaker than my left. Yeah. They said, oh, well, we'll do it in your right leg. Yeah. That yeah, it, the it wrong depends. Oh, that was the wrong leg. It was leg. the weaker leg. Well, it depends. As I, as I say, I, I mean, uh, if, if the co patient complains about weakness, there can still be some remaining muscle tissue. The whole issue is that you know for sure that you do not end up with only fat. So it might be taken from the weakest muscle, but there must still be muscle. Did they do an MRI prior to the biopsy? Well, I heard this morning, I didn't know that, that it's very difficult um, to get uh, reimbursement for uh, an MRI. That is not the case in my country. Yeah. I have a comment to make about that. Um, they did but, the same to me yeah. when they did my biopsy. They took it from my left leg, which my, which was my weaker leg. At first I thought, you know, they said, oh, it's gonna be like a one inch incision. So they went to the top of my leg and it was probably that long. They couldn't find good muscles, so they had to go on the side of my leg. So I had two incisions about four or five inches. Oh, long. Yeah. yeah, well, that is the reason why I always do an MRI. Yeah. Um, this is an, an other patient um, <coughs> the, uh, with uh, uh, pictures of the thigh muscles but also pictures of the lower legs and you can see that some of the calf muscle is affected uh, as well and here especially the, the thigh muscles again are affected but also a little bit of the uh, hamstrings so if I would, so if I would take a, a muscle biopsy from here it it's, would preferably be here instead of here because there's too many too much fat there and this is the same patient, but you see whiteness here, here and here, and that reflects inflammation. So what you can see on an MRI of a patient with IBM is both uh, muscles being replaced by fat, but on the other hand, uh, also inflammation, the whiteness. Doctor, comment on dysphagia. I, I don't know. Where, where are you? Okay, here, yeah, yeah. Did you hear my first one? Dysphagia. I was reading about that, and it's, I didn't like to read it, but it said that dysphagia is the sixth largest cause of death in the U.S. So when I asked my neurologist, who has practiced under Dr. Greenberg in yeah. Boston, yeah. Uh, I was diagnosed in 2010 at Mayo. Yeah. Uh, when I told her that, she says, well, are you having any problems with swallowing? And I said, no, not at this point. And yeah. she said, well, maybe if you haven't had it by this time, you won't be troubled with it. Have you had that experience with anybody? No and yes. Uh, sometimes you have to wait for a long time and patients uh, can get swallowing difficulty eventually. Uh, so that's why I think that IBM is not one disease. 
I think there are several subtypes. Most of the patients have problems with their thigh muscles, and then they develop a finger flexor weakness and a swallowing difficulty. Or in my patient uh, who started with swallowing difficulty, and there are patients who start with a finger flexor weakness, and it takes a long time before they uh, also uh, uh, have developed a swallowing difficulty. So I cannot predict whether someone gets swallowing difficulty. It's very likely, but it can take a long, long time. And I come back uh, to the worrying uh, consideration of dysphagia uh, being a, cause of, uh, a frequent cause of death. I'll come back to that later. I got a question on that too. Yeah. Now, before the research, I, I saw they say about 15% of people with IBM do get a small issue that I heard is 30%. I'll come back to that. I'll okay. show you figures, okay. real figures. Yeah, it's much more than that. <coughs> so back to my patients who kept me awake at night, I can assure you. Uh, so the MRI was normal. And then I thought, but I, I, must, I must go for a muscle biopsy in his leg because he's complaining about his leg. And I did a, uh, a blind muscle biopsy because I was sure of one thing, that not all his muscle tissue was replaced by fat. And indeed, uh, it, uh, the searcher, surgeon did a nice job and, and gave me uh, uh, a small piece of muscle which was processed in the lab and there we saw this picture. These are muscle fibers. And as you can see, they are of uh, variable size. You see a small one, but you also see a very large one here. Again, a, a small muscle fiber. But the most prominent abnormality is what you see between the muscle fibers. And these dots are inflammatory cells. And it's very typical of the inclusion body myositis to find inflammation between the muscle fibers, but sometimes also invading a muscle fiber. It's actually one disease in which this picture is being observed, and that is inclusion body myositis. So with confidence, I could tell this patient that he was suffering from inclusion body myositis. And, and of course, he was not happy with that diagnosis because I had to inform him about uh, the disease and about the prognosis. But on the other hand, after two years, he was delighted to have a diagnosis, know, to know what he was suffering from. Because I, I'm sure that uh, many people who are here in the audience had to wait for a long time because they, they, uh, before they were diagnosed. And there's I was told that there is nothing, uh, uh, that, that, it's, that it's awful to live in uncertainty uh, what the disease you are suffering from. So, so, can, can I, so point yeah. Out again, what, sure. I just wanted you to point out again, that what made you decide that that was inclusion body myositis? You see the muscle fibers? Yes. Yeah, here, here, uh -huh. here. And, 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 and here, between the two muscle fibers, there's nothing, a bit air. Okay. But here, you see that there are structures right. between the muscle fibers, and those structures are inflammatory cells. Okay. That indicates inflammation. And what is very suggestive of IBM is that these inflammatory cells invade a muscle fiber. Ah. So these findings described in the literature made me realize that IBM was the diagnosis in this patient. I think it's going to be taped so uh, it will be on the website. It's not what the back of his muscle biopsy that he had a few years ago. You know. Oh yeah, whether it looks like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Very yeah. No classic rim vacuoles? No, that's a good question. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, my good question was, <laughs> yeah. there, there are no classic no. rim vacuoles no. in your sample. No, that's right. Uh, a couple of, well, let's say the, the classical 
uh, histopathological picture of inclusion body myositis required rimmed vacuoles, holes in the muscle right. with a red rim within the muscle fiber. But we found out uh, that that is not a necessity, that there are quite a number of patients with IBM who have this picture, and that suffices for inclusion body myositis without the rimmed vacuoles. And that might well be why uh, a number of patients with IBM are underrecognized because the doctors say, sorry, you may have the typical clinical picture of IBM, but your muscle biopsy does not show rim factor, so you do not have IBM. And we uh, did a, a thorough study on that, and we saw, and, and, and lots of experts now agree with us that you can have IBM without the rim factors. You have a question? Mike. Is that even more um, data to show that there are more types of IBM then? That it might, that, that's an excellent question, and that might, might well be true. Uh, although I must say that we compared uh, IBM patients with and without rinfectals, and we could not find any difference. But sometimes you need many more patients, you know, uh, large groups on the uh, with rim vacuoles and a large group without. Uh, so I'm not completely sure about it, but uh, for now we say there's not much difference. No, no bearing on the progression of the disease? No, no, not. There, there is a question whether it has no bearing on the progression of the disease. No. And then uh, some clever guys found antibodies in IBM. <coughs> Dr. Greenberg was already mentioned, and at the same time a group in Nijmegen, in my country. And they said, you know, we do not have to do a muscle biopsy anymore because we have found antibodies. We just draw some blood and we know whether someone has IBM uh, or not. Well, Unfortunately, nothing is 100% sure uh, in medicine. So uh, the uh, antibodies can be found in uh, one third to 70% of the patients. And we now also know that these antibodies can be found in patients with Sherbert syndrome or lupus uh, without having myositis. And, and very recently, these antibodies were also found in patients with dermatomyositis. So we have to conclude that these antibodies are unfortunately not specific to uh, IBM, uh, which means that we still have to do a muscle biopsy. Um, there, there have been discussions on whether IBM uh, is a myositis in, in the fact that it's an, an, an autoimmune disease. Uh, and, and currently, uh, we think it's both an autoimmune disease with inflammation and uh, a result of aging or degeneration of the muscle for which we do not know the, the cause. And, and the fact that uh, there are patients with IBM who also have Sjogren syndrome and rheumatoid or, or rheumatoid arthritis uh, indicates that indeed it is also an autoimmune disease. Now the studies on the clinical features. This one, the first one, is uh, uh, a survey amongst clinicians. I was one of those clinicians. There were physicians approached from uh, seven countries, in total 585 patients. And as you can see, <coughs> the, the disease is uh, uh, especially occurring in patients uh, over 50 years. So there are no 20 year olds or children with IBM. And here you see from that same study that uh, it's talking about progression here it says that it takes about uh, 30 years after diagnosis, so that might well be 
15 years, maybe even longer uh, before uh, patients need a, a wheelchair. And here, responding to your question about dysphagia, it says that in 60% of the patients uh, there, is, there are swallowing difficulty. So that's more than 15 and 30. But we have to remember that these data were derived from physicians who had perhaps well-advanced uh, patients, patients who are at a well-advanced uh, uh, stage of the disease. And here you also see uh, that 44% of the patients uh, suffered from falls, which might lead to fractured arms, legs, or uh, head injury. One of my questions about whenever I see something like, and I talk about it from the time of diagnosis. Yeah. I think everyone in this room who has IBM knows that they had IBM yeah. years before, or you know, before diagnosis. So how, I know that I've had it for 13 years and only been diagnosed for three, but only because I could look back at old labs and saw my AST and ALT liver enzymes oh, LOA okay. did. That's even more accurate. Yeah. So I know that yeah. the inception of the disease was 19 or 2005. And you were diagnosed when? Uh, three years ago. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So a long time of denying, yeah. a long time of saying, okay, you got bad knees and you got you're not getting any younger, and I don't know what this sure. is. Sure. Yeah. But All sorts of reasons. Right. I'll, sh I'll show you what patients uh, tell us about that. And, and, there, and, and that can be difficult as well, because uh, some, like the patient with the swallowing difficulty, you know? He didn't recognize that as, as, as being a normal. So um, this, is, these, this is the data from the survey amongst the IBM patients here in the United States. States 916 patients participated. That is really amazing. And uh, with regard to the, the age, uh, it's more or less the same. It uh, starts at uh, around 50. And then uh, quite a number of patients also over 80. And uh, again, what I said before, more males, 66.9 uh, affected uh, than uh, females. Um, I, I was wondering, how many people go undiagnosed and just think that it's part of the aging process like we <coughs> did at first? And how many people out there have this disease, but they just never ever... I wouldn't bet on it, uh, but I'm sure that's a consider considerable number of, of people. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, that's what you said uh, as well. Mm -hmm. um, these are questions pertaining to daily living and ambulation and, and uh, as you can see only 36% uh, of the patients has no difficulty with swallowing, 44% plus 12%, more than 50% um, have choking and uh, a, a small percentage here but we, we do not know who participated in that survey and who did not need tube feeding. I, I mentioned the decreased dexterity because of the finger flexor weakness. Well, you see here all sorts of complaints, uh, slow or sloppy handwriting, able to grip a pen but unable to write. And the same holds true for cutting food and handing, uh, handling you, uh, utensils. Uh, food must be cut by someone else but can still feed slowly can cut most foods, some help needed, quite a percentage of people who have difficulty. Oh. Um, and this uh, pertains to the leg muscles, well you can see it for yourself, uh, independent uh, being able to uh, sit, to come from sit to stand is only 2.8%. And unable to stand 14% requires assistance from a device or person, uh, nearly 35%. And walking 
or you see the percentages here. 26% wheelchair department uh, dependent, but nearly 25 dependent on assistant uh, device. And this was very interesting. The question was, what impact does IBM have on your work, including uh, housework? And you can see, not at all, only 2.3%. And extremely and considerably more than 70%. So that's the impact. I must say that, that this survey was very, very insightful. Uh, and here, we'll come back to your uh, comment on, uh, well, the late diagnosis. First, there was a question uh, what the symptoms were that uh, made the patient go uh, to the doctor, and that is, as you can see, variable. Uh, trouble swallowing, uh, weakness, difficulty climbing stairs, fatigue was also a reason in 30% uh, of the patients, and the time span between first observed symptoms and first doctor diagnosis. 55, 56, 46% uh, more than two years. So uh, it, it takes a while before the patient goes and see his doctor, and then it takes a while before the GP uh, says, I'm going to refer you to a neurologist or uh, to a rheumatologist. And as I showed you for the patient with the swallowing difficulty, it took me another year, and I'm a specialist on IVM, to establish the diagnosis IVM. So you're, you're right. I, I think it's more a question of five years or more before people are diagnosed than, than less than that. I had another question about the, uh, you know, some a lot, a lot of IBM people I've heard some have foot drop. Yeah. Uh, I've never had the foot drop problem, but is that something that would develop over time with all of them, or is that just on particular cases? Well, I, you know, I have the the, the same answer uh, as the gentleman who was sitting uh, in the row in, in front of you, that it might well be, but I'm not sure about it. I also uh, had um, have diagnosed patients with uh, IBM who only had a foot drop and, and some finger flexor weakness and then developed uh, uh, subsequently weakness of the thigh muscles. But there are also patients who not develop foot drop at all. And whether that's one disease or manifestations, various manifestations of, uh, of IBM and have to be considered a subtype, we just don't know. Um, well, this well, is real quick question back on this. Yeah. I've been hearing over and over again from IBM that exercise is going to be the solution. I'll come to back to that. To this? To this to the swallowing problem? No, 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 no. Okay, so we're condemned somewhere down the line, theoretically, to get that and there's not going to be anything that can prevent it. Not prevent it. No, not, okay. not now. No, not prevented. Yeah. yeah. I need a sleeping pill tonight then. <laughs> it, uh, it, it has been said over and over again during this annual conference, but I mean, it's, it's not sufficient to diagnose a patient with IBM and then refer the patient back to the GP. You've got to follow up these patients. And, and not only me, as a neurologist, I do this together with our rehabilitation physician. That's the way we have arranged it in, in the Netherlands. It's the neurologist and the rehabilitation physician with his or her team, the OT, the PT, etc. And, and when it's necessary, I ask the um, uh, ENT specialist if there are swallowing difficulty or if uh, people uh, develop uh, shortness of breath. I ask the pulmonologist for a consultation, but in fact, it's the, the team, the basic team, is the neurologist and the rehabilitation physician. It's in, in, in my country. And it might be different in, in other countries. Uh, but multidisciplinary treatment is the, is the key word. So what do I do if I do a follow-up? I, uh, I ask the patient uh, whether he or she 
uh, has uh, observed any uh, progression of the muscle weakness, but I specifically also ask them whether they have developed swallowing difficulty if at that time uh, they did not have the fascia. And if they have developed um, a swallowing difficulty, uh, it's important to uh, do some imaging. And there are uh, a few possibilities, either what we uh, call uh, endosco uh, endoscopy, uh, or the video fluoroscopy, if, uh, as I showed you before. And Dr. Jens Schmidt, who is also here, one of the, uh, the medical advisory board uh, members, has done a very, very elegant piece of research on a real-time uh, MRI. Uh, here you need contrast, and I can tell you that uh, uh, one of the, my patients who was participating in the bimagrama uh, trial and that required uh, several um, uh, video fluoroscopies nearly choked on the contrast. So it, it's, it's still uh, a research tool but I really hope that it will uh, become a, a routine tool. Uh, it's only a few mil, the whiteness is uh, pineapple juice only a few mil of pineapple juice. And that's completely different from the uh, amount of uh, contrast, barium contrast that people have to swallow for a video fluoroscopy. There are patients who don't, do not complain about swallowing uh, difficulty, but if you do uh, one of these imaging uh, methods, then you can still detect some uh, abnormalities, yes? Yes, uh, my wife has IBM was swallowing difficulty in. We were at your class in Uruguay, in San Diego, where you mentioned the MRI with pineapple juice because she just went through total swallowing evaluation and it was one of those tests was very hard on her to swallow. And that's probably what you're talking about. And you're saying with the MRI there is no contrast. No, it's a uh, the, the pineapple juice gives the contrast. But okay, I, I, you, you it, did say that. I have I have a, a nephew. Okay, I have a nephew who practices ear, nose, and throat in North Carolina in the United States, and he's been trying to find out something about this type of, he is unable to find out information on, and you said it's a study protocol, but where, isn't there something? I'll write it down for you. I would appreciate it. Yeah, that. after this presentation, I go to my iPhone, I look it up, and I write it down okay, for you. Okay, thank yeah. you. I'll and you can show it to your nephew. This slide brings me to many. Ma'am, yeah. I have a question. Where? Right here. Yeah. I have a problem with, I have a lot of phlegm that comes, wants to come back up. And I cough a lot, and phlegm comes up all the time. Yeah. What, is this part of the IBM? The, the slime is because you have difficulty with swallowing the slime. Okay. And it looks like you have much more slime than, than you should have, but that's because we, we, we swallow every day, a thousand times. And, and if, it, if there is weakness of that swallowing muscle, it, it, comes in, in, it, it remains in your mouth and you have difficulty getting rid of it. Yeah, I, I cough a lot and yeah. when I cough it comes black. Yeah, um, it has to do with the disease. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So is that something that we should have? Well, I think so, yeah. I okay, think so. thank you. Yeah. Well, I already talked about management, follow-up of the patient, listening to the patient, asking the right question is key. Uh, and I already mentioned the monitoring of the dysphagia because the med sir, there is no way to prevent it, but there is a way to treat it. Several ways. Um, what they call myotomy, the, 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 the muscle that is stronger than the other muscles prevent the food from growing down and that can be uh, cut. Or, as in my patients, uh, the specialist can uh, give uh, injections, sometimes repeated injections of, uh, of Botox. A monitoring of the leg and hand weakness uh, is important and as I said, I do that together with the Rehabilitation physician. I already mentioned the multidisciplinary team, the uh, PT and the OT, and I like to mention uh, exercise. Here at the annual congr conference is uh, 
Elian uh, Alexanderson from Sweden. I see you nod. She is an expert on exercise and I must admit that I did not know about exercise being a medicine. I knew that it's not detrimental, that you can easily exercise, it does not damage the muscle, but I did not know that it was also beneficial. And um, uh, myositis and exercise should be normal, should be prescribed. I, I come back to that later. Um, uh, orthosis is uh, also an assisted uh, device for, especially for people who have drop uh, uh, feet on one leg, sometimes like this gentleman on uh, both uh, legs. Um, and it's important to say, but that's something that is uh, sounds too familiar for uh, for you all, that uh, at the moment there is no effective treatment. Uh, in uh, the past, we all thought it's a myositis, so why don't we treat patients with IBM like we treat patients with dermatomyositis and with polymyositis, with steroids, prednisone, with azathioprine, with methotrexate, with IVIG. It has all been tried uh, and there have been treatment trials in IBM, but it, it's unfortunately not effective. <laughs> Two words. Um, I would just like to ask a question about Botox. Yeah. Um, I don't know how long that's been going on. I mean, I'm a nurse and I've never heard of it for that, but that doesn't mean anything. But who typically does that? ENT or it depends. GI guy or who? It depends. Since it's a swallowing difficulty, it's either the ENT as in, in, in my patient or a GE. Okay. But it should be a specialist. It should not be a GE specialist or an ENT specialist who has never done this before. It should really be a Botox specialist. Okay, yeah? thank you. Um, can, I, can I ask yeah, about oh, yeah, the IVIG? Sure, sure. You have a question. Yeah. Um, my husband gets IVIG every five weeks and low dose prednisone, yeah. five milligrams a day. And there is some change. Now, is that because he doesn't have IBM, or is that just because? That's hard to say. I, I, I also had patients uh, who, uh, who were referred to me and were already on IVIG and on a low dose, five milligrams, low dose, uh -huh. doses of prednisone, and felt great with it. Uh, so I did not withdraw that medication. Uh -huh. Some wanted to get rid of the IVIG because you have to, is it a, a home uh, treatment? You have to go to the hospital. Yeah. Well, some of my patients found that, you know, a nuisance and they wanted to get rid of the treatment. But I'm sorry, he's on seven, he corrected me. Sorry? He's on seven. Seven, okay. oh, that's still okay. low dose. Yeah. Yeah. This is what we now know on the long-term outcome in uh, SIBM. Well, I, I told you, <coughs> I showed you the figures about um, being becoming wheelchair dependent. And as regards the life expectancy, there have been only a few studies uh, on that. And what th uh, these studies showed was that in IBM patients, there is on the one hand, a normal life expectancy, but on the other hand, uh, there are more patients who uh, have uh, what we call aspiration, that they had, that the food came into the lungs because of the dysphagia, and that might uh, affect the life expectancy. But there are no uh, solid figures about that. So there have to be more studies on that. Real quick, if that becomes serious, can the eating tube solve that problem? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, because there is currently no effective curative treatment, and because we all do realize the significant unmet needs of patients with IBM, there are plenty of treatment uh, trials. Uh, you see that 
here they well the, the as a diaphragm it attracts a but all sorts of other medications even stem cell stem cell transplant have been tried but uh, these uh, all these um, uh, drugs were not uh, effective and now uh, you may have heard uh, Dr. Maas and Dimashki uh, they are about to start a trial with arimoclomol uh, I, I must say that I was utterly surprised to hear that uh, the trial had not been initiated because they have been talking about it since about two years but uh, it's about to start now in several I think in 15 centers in total <coughs> 14 here in the US and one uh, in the UK in London uh, there uh, is uh, has been a uh, pilot study in Volstetten I'll come back to that in a, in a second and there has been a huge trial with uh, bimagromab and we all thought that this was going to work but unfortunately it failed. And why did we think that uh, it would work? Well, first some words about the bimagromab. Well, you can all see that this is a huge cow. It's not a normal cow, very muscular. And why is this cow so muscular? Because uh, it has a gene defect. Uh, it has a defect in a gene called myostatin. And because uh, the myostatin does not work uh, in the cow, uh, she develops huge muscles. So they thought one of the problems in IgM is the decrease in size of the muscles. Why don't we try to increase the size of the muscles? And for that, a uh, uh, agent, a drug was uh, found which uh, inhibits the effect of myostatin. And in uh, Boston, uh, the group of uh, Stephen Greenberg and, uh, and Tony Amato did a trial on, uh, on patients. They uh, uh, provided patients with that drug for a period of eight weeks and they had what we call two outcome measures. One was the six minute walk test to test the function of the muscles and the other one was an MRI in order to uh, uh, see whether indeed the muscle mass uh, increased. And uh, the result was very positive. Blue line is the uh, memorable uh, patient and the red line is the patient with the placebo. And you see a difference, especially uh, at uh, eight weeks. And the same holds true for the six minute uh, walk test. And this uh, reached its maximum at 16 weeks. So they thought the trial is positive, we're going to start a real randomized controlled trial. But as often is the case, unfortunately, uh, that trial was what we call negative. There was one primary outcome measure, and that was the six minute uh, walk test. And um, unfortunately, as you can see, there were uh, three dosages of uh, bimagromab, 10, 3, 1 milligram, and placebo. Placebo is the, the dark one, the black one, as you can see. It looked like uh, at uh, week 24, uh, the 10 milligram uh, did better as compared to all the other dosages of placebo, but after about a year, there was no difference uh, at all. What they did see was that as they measured the body mass, that there was a difference between the 10 and the 3 milligram uh, in comparison with the 1 milligram and the placebo. But this result was not good enough for uh, the company, so uh, the pharmaceutical company stopped the trial. All the patients and we, the physicians, were very, very disappointed uh, about this result because we really believed that uh, this drug was uh, effective. There uh, are some promising results. I already mentioned uh, arimoclomol and, uh, and folostatin. It's Dr. Jerry Mandel who uh, did some work on folostatin. Uh, uh, drug was uh, delivered to the uh, thigh muscles of six patients with uh, IBM 
and this is uh, a muscle biopsy from uh, before the treatment and you see that there is lots of what we uh, call connective tissue between the muscle fibers and after treatment the muscle fibers uh, are adjacent to each other and that connective tissue uh, disease has, uh, has gone. And what he also showed was that the treated patients uh, were able uh, to do a better six minute walk test as compared to the uh, placebo uh, treated patients. So this seems to work in six patients, but unfortunately I've never heard uh, of this follistatin again. Yes? Uh, I think there were two problems with it. One is that it is attached to a virus and yeah, so how it gets therapy. in. Yeah. So the body, once that virus is used, develops antibodies yeah. and it, it'll attack that virus the next time that it's used. So you yeah. have to find a different virus. Uh, and if you talk to Dr. Mandel, he'll tell you, give me $3 million and we'll keep going. <laughs> um, but <laughs> I, the, the question I have, and I don't know if that's within your area, there is a new technique uh, for gene splitting. It, the initials are CRISPR. Yeah, just for is that, is that a potential way of delivering a drug like folistatin without having to attach it to a I virus? don't think so. I, I think that well, it might well be true because I'm not an expert on that. But uh, uh, currently in research uh, uh, experiments, they use CRISPR-Cas um, for genetic diseases. But it, it might well be true. But I didn't know that there were financial barriers to uh, continue that's to study. That's according to Dr. Yeah. Because the, Dr. Mandel also uh, did treatment in patients with uh, spinal muscular atrophy. And that was also done with uh, the same virus. Yeah. But anyway, this seems to be very uh, promising. And we uh, already discussed uh, arimoplomol. That uh, there has been uh, an animal study. And uh, in those animals, um, those with uh, uh, arimoplomol uh, had better, uh, had a less change in their functional score at four months, uh, eight months, and 12 months. And their muscle strength uh, also uh, decreased um, uh, at a much slower pace as compared to the placebo uh, controlled uh, animals. Then um, Dr. Olivier Benveniste, who is also a member of the advisory board, did a very interesting study with a drug, rapamycin, which we know uh, from because it's used in patients who uh, undergo a kidney transplantation, for instance. So we exactly know what the side effects uh, of this drug uh, are. And uh, he uh, and he said, now it's a mistake. Um, his primary outcome measure was muscle strength and not the six minute walk test. And unfortunately, uh, after uh, treatment, the, uh, there was no what we call significant change in the muscle strength, but there were quite some other outcome measures like the uh, six minute walk test, for instance, but also a functional scale and an MRI in which there was a significant uh, uh, change uh, in, and, uh, uh, as regards to uh, placebo. So he wanted to do a proper trial with more people. Uh, he only uh, had 22 people in the uh, rapamycin arm and, and 22 in the placebo arm, but the pharmaceutical company said no interest at all because we know the drug it's used in kidney transplantation, and uh, sorry, you have to, again, financial, look for your own funding. And I, I'm, I'm certain that this trial is going to, uh, to uh, be initiated because Dr. Olivier Benfidist wrote to me, wrote to our uh, colleagues, and I, I think that we can do this trial. As I said, it, it looks promising, encouraging results. Um, well, I already mentioned exercise as therapy. I'm not an expert on it, uh, but uh, Elian uh, Alexanderson uh, uh, recommends mild to moderate uh, intensity uh, exercise should not be non uh, should not be fatiguing, 
and I came across a very interesting study which uh, was done in Brazil, of all places, uh, in uh, 2010. This is the, uh, these are the data on the publication. And what they did was uh, inflate cuffs around both thigh muscles and then asked the gentleman to do exercise, extending the leg or doing uh, semi-squats. And although he did this in uh, only a handful of patients, here too the results were very encouraging. But uh, as, as always, you have to reproduce this in a larger number of, uh, of patients. I asked uh, Elian Alexanderson uh, about it, whether she really believed in it. Uh, and we both know of a, uh, a Danish neurologist who uh, uh, has done this treatment in patients with other types of myositis and that was very effective. So it, it might well be that this uh, uh, is going to be investigated and is going to be recommended. Um, well, I have talked about trials, about the difficulty with trials and here is a summary of that. Uh, I mentioned that we have to be aware of the fact that it might well be that there is not one single IBM, but that there are several uh, subtypes. We have to uh, obtain in the data about that. Uh, we have to uh, have more knowledge about how we could measure uh, functional uh, decline, better outcome measures. It may well be that six minute walk test is not appropriate for all patients with uh, IBM. Very important, I also mentioned this uh, this morning that we listen to the patient, what they find their most important uh, complaints, and we call that patient-related uh, outcomes, and that we develop what we call biomarkers, uh, other tools which tell us whether there is uh, uh, progression of the disease or not, and it, it's, it's, this is also very promising, it has been used uh, to measure uh, deterioration in other muscle diseases, and it may well be that it's also very suitable for IBM. And that, uh, uh, yeah, well, this is a, a score which may be used uh, to measure the effect of clinical trials. And that brings me to uh, my last slide. As, as I said before, we are aware of the unmet needs and, and uh, that means that we have to be searching for uh, the best drugs that really have impact on uh, IBM. I thank you for your attention. Thank you. <laughs> Doctor, I have a question. Yeah. In your practice, have you ever heard of the drug Thymogen? Sorry? Thymogen. Thymogen. What kind of drug is that? After my diagnosis, the doctor told me that from my balance issue, Pymogen might be the, the drug, but I would have to go to Russia to get it. To Russia? <laughs> I found it in Latvia. I got a prescription, they sent it to me. I used it, you dropped it into your nose, alternating it for so many days, and you put it. And I, of course, I was hopeful, yeah, so I ordered it again. And when I did that, it came from St. Petersburg, Russia. And then I kept doing it, and I, again, I was very hopeful, and I thought it was working. But when I tried to make the third order, they said, no, they could not do that anymore. Of course, the FDA, you know, I suppose it was illegal for me to do this. But you have not heard of it. No, I have never heard of it. No. Okay. No, I'm sorry. Okay, thank you. Hooray yeah. for the group at TMA. It's the Myositis Association. Helping patients become peers. Now for the past 25 years. So if you have been diagnosed, here's an organ.
organization to unite us. Eight thousand members they can boast. For that real strange word that no one's heard, it's myositis. There's an annual patient conference, which is just second to none, where you'll learn a lot and network, and you'll also have some fun. And their website is updated with a lot of current news, with lots of info and resources, and much more that you can use, like info TMA compiles, and like lists of clinical trials, and lists of research too, you can review, cause it's all there for you. So hooray for the group TMA, it's the Myositis Association, helping patients become peers, now for the past 25 years. So if you have been diagnosed, here's an organization to unite us, a quarter century they can the group that's got the scoop on myositis. Oh.